Got a few more arriving here. So welcome to everyone. Welcome to our series on the Catholic perspectives on racism and white supremacy. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Burns, the director of the Harp Center for Catholic Thought and Culture, and I'm delighted to welcome Bishop Mark Seitz from the Diocese of El Paso this afternoon. A few in insights to make your viewing more uh, enjoyable. First, you want to set your view to speaker view. This will enable you to have a better view of Bishop Seitz during his talk. Everyone will be muted during the talk. If you would like to ask a question, please submit a question through the chat function on your Zoom panel at the bottom. At the end of his talk, he will entertain a number of questions that will be moderated by uh, Dr. Michael Lovett Collier. Uh, and so we will have a question and answer at that point. You also might want to turn your own uh, video off, which will help the bandwidth in this presentation. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Lovett Collier of University Ministry to introduce our president. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us today for this very important and timely topic. My task is very brief but important, which is to welcome and thank our president, Dr. Harris, for being with us today. For those of us as a part of the USD community, we're familiar with Dr. Harris, but for those who, who are not, just like to do a brief introduction. Dr. James D. Harris became the president of the University of San Diego in August of 2015. So by my calculations, that's about five years. <laughs> uh, before that, he served as for 13 years as president of Widener University in Philadelphia, and prior to that as president of Defiance College in Defiance, Ohio. During Dr. Harris's time at USD, one of his main focuses has been envisioning 2024, our strategic planning process that anticipates our 75th anniversary in that year, and that includes a significant focus and concern for diversity, equity, and inclusion at all levels of our institution. During his time with us, Dr. Harris has created a number of working groups and task forces charged with assessing and further developing our diverse and inclusive community, building on the work already done, as well as addressing the ongoing opportunities and needs to, for improvement. In recognition of his considerable contributions to education and the committees he served on across the country, President Harris has been the recipient of many awards and honors, all of which are listed on, on his bio, but I'll just mention briefly some leadership awards from the NAACP and the Urban League for his work on defending civil rights. We're very grateful for his investment in and commitment to uh, the issue that we're talking about today, which is racial justice and racism, and his willingness to be with us to introduce the bishop. Thank you very much, President Harris. Michael, thank you for your very kind introduction. And Jeffrey, uh, this is a marvelous series, so thank you for bringing this together. I also want to thank, I see that uh, Bishop McElroy is on the call today. Bishop McElroy, it's, it's always wonderful to have you with us. I, uh, Michael, uh, last week I had someone introduce me and say he's been the a Catholic he's been the president Catholic president of a university president Catholic president of University of San Diego for five years. I said, well I've always been a Catholic president. It's only been five years at the University of San Diego. It's my honor today to uh, formally introduce our our guest, uh, the most Reverend Mark Seitz. Uh, Bishop Seitz has been was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the eldest of 10 children. Uh, and he was ordained as a priest in the Diocese of Dallas in 1979 after receiving his bachelor's degree in philosophy as well as a master's of divinity and an MA in theology from the University of Dallas. He, uh, he also received his uh, master's in liturgical studies at St. John's University in Minnesota. So he comes to us as an academic as well. After his priestly uh, ordination, uh, Bishop Seitz served as a pastor of multiple parishes uh, around Dallas, Texas. And he also taught liturgical and um, sacramental theology at the University of Dallas. And he told me earlier that he's on serving now on the board of that fine university and a sister institution as well. In 2010, uh, Pope Benedict elevated him to the office of bishop. And he was then ordained and appointed as the auxiliary bishop of Dallas. In 2013, uh, Pope Francis appointed Bishop Seitz as the sixth bishop of El Paso. And he is serving the borderland community whose sister uh, cities are just across the border in Mexico. And he's focused his work and his heart on the poor and vulnerable 
including migrant families, refugees who've made their home in the region or who chose to live in the community as their point of passage. Uh, the bishop believes that migrants add value to the communities where they choose to live and that parishes and community members should welcome them with compassion, with love and solidarity. Uh, he has chosen the topic of today of Night Will Be No More, Racism and Hope on the Border. Uh, this title is uh, also, he wrote a article about this as well, which was published in the aftermath of 2019 of the horrible shooting event in August uh, of that year at a Walmart in El Paso. Um, Bishop Seitz, it's an honor to have you here, and there's no more important topic for us to discuss today. And we see you as a sister uh, parish in a diocese to the to San Diego and all the good work that we're doing here. And we're really thankful for your time. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Harris, for your very kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon and thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be here today. It's, it's a real honor. I've been asked to speak about the topic of race and hope on the border. These are issues which have taken on new relevancy and immediacy in light of recent events, especially in our national struggles to affirm the dignity of black lives and to address the ongoing pandemic. I don't think that these two things are unconnected. I think we all feel that there are deep movements going on beneath our feet that we are wrestling with deep-seated issues with historical resonance and spiritual weight. There are very profound and subterranean connections. The pandemic in particular continues to push us beyond our comfort zones, beyond the edges, beyond common places and cliches. Both the cry of black Americans for equality and more deeply for justice, as well as the pandemic have fallen like divine meteors striking uh, from heaven, throwing everything off course, tilting our social, political and moral axes we can try to continue carrying on as before, as if nothing happened. But we will run up against limits, not of our own creation, moral limits, spiritual limits, divine limits. There is something mysterious and divine about the pushing about this pushing and prodding. Our Holy Father, I believe, is very much feeling this too. He states very plainly that it is in large part what motivated him to write his latest encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, which I encourage all of you to read. In it, he notes very tellingly that the pandemic has only made it all the more urgent that we rethink our styles of life, our relationships, the organization of our societies, and above all, the meaning of our existence. He gestures towards a very basic decision we need to make in order to rebuild our wounded world. We are at a decision point, a moment of crisis, and the Pope writes, in moments of crisis, decisions become urgent. I want to come back to this theme, but first let me describe for you a moment that I experienced just one year ago that tilted the access, access of the border community in which I live. I'm speaking about the massacre of August 3rd, 2019. You might say, for me at least, it was the beginning of being woke. A rare, quiet, unscheduled Saturday morning changed in an instant when I, a call came in about the events unfolding at our Ciela Vista Walmart. I called the county judge and we met at the hospital so he could get me past security. I worked my way to the emergency room and 
I immediately began to see the carnage. I entered a room where the body of a young mother lay. She had probably been holding her six week old baby in her arms alongside her husband when they were both murdered. She fell on the baby who survived with a contusion on his head and broken fingers. I gave conditional absolution and said some prayers for the dead. Then I was ushered into a room of a middle-aged Spanish-speaking woman shot in the thigh. She was concerned only for her husband who had also been shot. They were unable to give her any information about him. Many victims were brought to surgery immediately and I was unable to visit them. When there was a lull in the arrival of ambulances, I went over to the children's hospital. I visited the baby whose mother had been killed as she held him. No one knew his name. He would seem surprisingly calm. In the room next to him was a nine-year-old girl shot in the leg. She told me that she was from Chihuahua, Mexico and that her family was passing through El Paso on vacation and had decided to make a quick stop at Walmart. The day wore on and the pain of the victims and their families began to accumulate. I did the only thing I could do at that moment. I, I shared it with the Lord. In those days, my responsibility as a priest, called to bring hope into the most desperate situations, was ever before my eyes. You can't do it with trite sayings. You can't minimize the rawness of grief. You can't wish away pain. But I do know now that for me, with faith, it is possible to look darkness and death in the eye and come out on the other side. It's as the poet Julia Esquival writes, Lo que no nos deja dormir es que nos han amenazado de resurrección. They can but threaten us with resurrection. That faith carried me through the succeeding days of grieving and burials. What happened that day would take 23 lives. The act of racial terrorism in El Paso took many of us out of complacency and startled many of us awake. What happened in El Paso that day is important and needs to be remembered. The proximate cause of what became the deadliest attack on Latinos in modern history was a shooter, a young man, who claimed he had come to kill Mexicans, to take up an armed position of defense, defense of a white nation from the external threat of invasion from brown people across the southern border. But what happened cannot be fully understood apart from a broader context. That context extends to the use by our nation's highest elected officials of words like invasion and killers over and over to refer to migrants. It extends to the criminal treatment of migrant children and families as pawns on a crass political chessboard. It extends to wall building and our exploitation and mistreatment of asylum seekers. And it extends much, much further into the origins of our border communities and our countries. Hatred of Latinos is not new. What happened in El Paso is in many ways the outcome of centuries of ritualized hate against people of color and white supremacy. 
The El Paso massacre is reminiscent of a long history of killings, massacres, and racism directed at Latinos, Asians, Blacks, indigenous, mulatos, and mestizos in the Southwest. These are stories often pushed underground. You really have to come to El Paso to understand our unique geographic place on the border. You can bring on slide one. We are situated in a valley which we share with our sister city of Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, nestled between the southernmost point of the Rocky Mountain Range and the northern point of the Sierra in Mexico, an amazing point where the Americas converge. And change the slide. If you were to look at our border community from the sky or on Google Maps, you would really be hard pressed to discern where El Paso ends and Ciudad Juarez begins. You're looking at both right now, downtown El Paso and Ciudad Juarez extending beyond it. And we are in the middle of a great desert, the Chihuahua, once my, a once mighty river runs through us, now reduced by climate change and industrial farming. Napoleon once said that great empires are bounded by great mountain ranges, rivers, or deserts. In El Paso, we have all three. On account of the geostrategic importance of our place on the border, our land and the peoples who have lived here, indigenous, Spanish, Hispanic, Mexican, Tejano, American, and many more, have been subject to multiple colonizations over time. One can speak of a triple colonization. You can come back. First, by the Spanish in the Choque de Culturas, which was the colonization of the indigenous and their lands. A sober reading of the history of colonization can discern both the presence of a genuine Christian missionary impulse, as well as the deployment of white supremacy and cultural oppression as tools of economic ambition, imperial adventurism, and political expansion. It was in the encounter between the Spanish colonists and indigenous communities that fateful identities were co-produced and sinful notions of civilized versus uncivilized and the invention of the savage were born. The pain and experience of estrangement is still experienced by some communities in the Southwest today. Manifest destiny, as well as shifting colonial, nationalistic, and expansionistic winds led to constantly shifting borders and to the second colonization of the Southwest by the United States. This brought a wave of prejudice, harsh laws, and social exclusion against Latinos and other people of color, disenfranchisement, the lynching of Latinos, the internment of Mexicans, and the development of institutions with racialized origins. Let me offer some examples of those institutions which speak to the reality of racialized systems. The land that is El Paso and Texas passed after the era of colonization from Spain to Mexico. When Mexico banned slavery, white slaveholders in Texas agitated for independence and union with the United States, provoking the Mexican-American War. In other words, the origin of our state is enmeshed with the protection of the institution of black slavery. Its very origins are racialized. Another example, 
1924, the United States explicitly adopted racial quotas as the framework for its immigration policies, overtly discriminating against Catholics from Southern Europe, as well as Asians. Agricultural interests on the border objected to the inclusion of Mexicans in these quotas because of the demand for cheap Mexican labor. In order to satisfy the generalized xenophobia which fueled the 1924 Immigration Act, Mexicans were exempted. But there was a price. Mexicans were exempted in exchange for the creation of the Border Patrol, created, as the name suggests, to patrol brown people. Whatever one thinks of the need for border enforcement, the historical origins of this massive agency operating within our border communities are explicitly racialized, which continues to shape both the community's perception of border enforcement as well as the self-understanding and identity of enforcement agencies, enforcement agents. A third wave of colonization arrived in this era of free trade in which we now live, of global commerce, which for our border communities began with NAFTA. We are now part of, a, of the global trade community, and this physically shapes our community with trucks and free trade warehouses and individual plants in our sister city, and also with walls. Because the logic of free trade demands that a labor force remain on the other side of the border wall in the interest of international profit. The large steel barriers that divide our sister cities went up with NAFTA and not by coincidence. The origin of those barriers, too, are racialized. In her recent book, Isabel Wilkerson points out that institutionalized racism in America is a version of caste. With this concept, she describes a system in which one group preserves power by maintaining division through the assignment of value. Those who are different are kept on the lower echelons of power and opportunity. In our country, those of European origin, especially those of lighter skin color, have claimed that higher position. Caste is not so much a developed ideology as it is a pre-conscious and even in a sense pre-moral system into which we are all born. It is not taught so much as absorbed through osmosis. It is not so much conscious moral choice as it is an immoral system. Ideologies simply serve to buttress this system. That is where racial discrimination emerges and calcifies in attitudes and actions. Wilkerson offers the example of purchasing an old house. After we've bought the house, unless something was deliberately concealed, we can't go back to the former owner and expect them to fix what's broken. We have to fix it. Just so, whether we explicitly as ascribe to an ideology of racial discrimination or not, whether we deploy prejudicial attitudes towards people of color or not, we are part of the system. And now we must confront it. With the massacre of 23 persons in our community, I learned at a visceral level that white supremacy is not just an unsettling concept, not just a crazy ideology or paranoid obsession. It is truly death dealing. As I wrote in my pastoral letter following the shooting, 
racism is really about advancing, shoring up, and failing to oppose a system of white privilege and advantage based on skin color. When this system begins to shape our public choices, structure our common life together, and become a tool of class, this is rightly called institutionalized racism. How does faith speak to a reality like this? The idea that human beings are not all endowed with the same human dignity, not part of the one human family, that some are more loved and more equal than others, that our worth is defined by our racial and cultural uniqueness, mocks Christian revelation and mocks God. White supremacy strikes at the core of Christian revelation that humanity has been loved into being by God, that every human being is the subject of God's love and mercy, that God so loved the world that he assumed our humanity and gave his life for us. Not only do white supremacy and racism threaten our faith, they also undermine the principles upon which our nation was founded, especially the insight described in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There is a link between the historical legacy of racism in our country and our treatment of immigrants. I might point out that this legacy began with the forced immigration of some millions of Africans to the Americas in the slave trade. Any relationship which allows a division between an us and a them risks being a seedbed of discrimination. Differences and diversity, assuming we are not speaking about distinctions between moral and immoral behavior, should be seen as contributing to the rich tapestry of humanity, a blessing providing for a complementary, complementarity and a richness that enhances our unity. Let me now return to what I think the Holy Father is trying to communicate in his new encyclical. In his document, the Holy Father uses the word heart more than 50 times. Indeed, chapter four is entitled, A Heart Open to the World. If the encyclical were a symphony, one of the main movements would be the expansion of the heart toward the stranger who becomes a neighbor, towards the foreigner, towards the mystery that encounters us in the other. This trajectory finds its fullest expression in fraternal love, the explicit theme of fratelli tutti, and a theme that resonates throughout the gospel. As Paul says in the epistle to the Galatians, the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This movement of the heart and the fraternal love that flows from it must find expression in public life, in our social structures, in political life. That is, in many ways, a major part of the mission of a Catholic university, to discern the possibilities of more deeply shaping our common life on the pattern of love, justice, and solidarity. Racism is deeply counter to fraternal love. In his encyclical, Pope Francis points out that the very existence of racism in society is a key index of how genuine our social progress really is. He speaks prophetically to the recurrence of racism in our own country 
of racism against people of color and xenophobic attitudes. He says, in addition to readiness to discard others, uh, in, in addition, a readiness to discard others finds expression in vicious attitudes that we thought long past, such as racism, which retreats underground only to keep reemerging. Instances of racism continue to shame us, for they show that our supposed social progress is not as real or definitive as we think. Later on, he writes, racism is a virus that quickly mutates and instead of disappearing, goes into hiding and lurks in waiting. In our own national context, we have the sense that we are wrestling with deep-seated, with a deep-seated national failure to live up to the ideals of equality expressed quite beautifully in the founding documents of our country, yet somehow always just out of reach, realizable only with great pain and struggle. There are still in our society exiles who are treated as foreign bodies, to quote Pope Francis. It's been exposed again in the very visible and, visceral, and in visceral examples of police brutality. It's been exposed in how unequally the weight of the pandemic has fallen upon certain communities. The Holy Father roots this in our failure to live up to our deepest nature, which is communion and solidarity hearts open in a progressive embrace of the stranger, of genuine human fraternity, of fraternal openness to the divine who comes to us in the other. As he says, individualism does not make us more free, more equal, more fraternal. None of us is saved alone. This is why I believe that this moment of crisis in which we are living is deeply providential. The pandemic and the struggle against racism represent a type of Kairos moment, an interruption of the divine into the ordinary course of affairs, a wake up call that things are not right and that we are at the brink the Holy Father is not blind to the real stakes of this drama. The first chapter of his encyclical is entitled, Dark Clouds Over a Closed World. There is an image of Mary you are probably familiar with, who has great resonance for our people on the border. I'm speaking of Mary of Guadalupe. If you recall the story, she appeared on Tepeyac to a representative of the indigenous Mexican people, Juan Diego, at the time of the Spanish conquest, at a time when their dehumanization and disenfranchisement by the Spanish was nearly total. The message sent to the indigenous by their oppressors, like the message sent by every oppressor was, you don't count you don't matter. The woman on Tepeyac, on the other hand, said to San Juan Diego, you count, tu vales. Today, this powerful woman says to the refugee turned away at the border, tu vales. To the worker displaced by free trade, she says, tu vales. To the family with mixed immigration status, she says, Ustedes valen. To the family that bears the weight of intergenerational trauma expressed in depression, abuse, and divorce, she says, Ustedes valen. You are loved. Her simple message persuades us, as it did that day on Tepeyac, that she is the God bearer. Theotokos, 
Only a woman such as this young brown mestiza empress, born on the edges of empire and who revealed herself anew on the edges of empire, could have convinced our people of the nearness and tenderness of God. She who shares in our in-betweenness. She is the mestiza who takes what is noble from each culture, elevates it, and points out new ways toward reconciliation. She takes on our people's pain and trauma, and she transforms it to give birth to hope and redemption. Guadalupe teaches us how we might go about repairing the sin of racism. She shows us that our deepest identity is not given to us by empire or politics or the economy or the colonist, but is a gift of God. Our identity is formed in the grace-filled relationships we freely pursue with God, others, and creation. If after the resurrection, the church continues Jesus' mission of restoring the unity of the whole human race, then to speak of the church and the reign of God is to speak of inclusion and diversity. This is the very opposite of the racist obsession with whiteness and purity and the false promises of resurgent ethno-nationalism. Every race and color and tribe and people and language and culture are threads in the vibrant and diverse tapestry of the reign of God. Our suffering and pain and dispossession are transfigured in the Jesus who died on the cross and who invites us to relocate our broken history, our imperfect lives, our de desires and aspirations, and our work for justice in the drama of his reign, which is unfolding all around us through the power of his resurrection. We need leaders like you to put this into practice, to give the movement of the heart towards the human fraternity expression. We need you to stand beside the poor as they find their voice and to take a supportive role in their work for justice. We must learn to build each other up rather than seeking to outsmart and outflank. Love is spontaneous, unselfish, full of surprise, life-giving, and forgiving. If we are to move our country toward a reconciled community beyond faction and resentment, we must commit ourselves to a love which is not merely self-directed, a love which we can learn at the feet of Jesus of Nazareth. This historical moment will require a new kind of leadership. How will we get through the current moment of crisis, a crisis which is social, environmental, political, without falling into a descending spiral of claim and counterclaim, polarization and division, a justice that descends into terror. It will require new thought and leadership from students like you and a new stewardship of power. We should not fear power. Power has been given to us as stewards by our God, who asks of us to be co-creators in bringing about his reign. But we must learn to use the power in new, creative, and grace-filled ways, not reproducing the tactics and methods of domination and division that, bring, that belong to the oppressor, but working for reconciliation 
in the recognition that our differences are enriching and that our deepest fulfillment will come in the realization of that moment of the heart toward genuine brother and sisterhood. Let us move forward to that new day that, that God has promised us. If our dream is also the dream of God, we have nothing to fear. And so we will move forward to that day when night will be no more. We will need no light from lamps or the sun, for the Lord God will be our light, and we will reign forever. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you very much, Bishop. I'm now going to turn it over to Michael Lillicollier, who will direct the question and answer period. Thank you very much, Bishop Seitz, for that wonderful address. We're very grateful for that. We do have time now for questions, so please do go ahead and type them into the chat. And as they come in, I'll lift them up and share them with the bishop to respond to. I wonder, though, just as people go ahead and get started, if I could offer a question, Bishop. Surely. It would be, you know, you spoke so eloquently and beautifully about the reality of institutionalized racism. And yet many people in our country and in fact in our church would dispute that it exists. Yeah. How would you respond? Uh, look again. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's one of the things I found very helpful about Wilkerson's uh, image of the caste system, because when people hear the word racism, they immediately go on the defenses, the defensive. But to understand that instead we are born into this system that is, as I said, pre-conscious um, and not chosen perhaps by us, uh, that perhaps gives us a way we can begin to recognize the way that these systems are in fact institutionalized. They're in our system and that's why they continue to to cause so many problems and divisions in our country, so many ideologies to rise up and, 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 and economic and social divisions and so on. Thank you. Uh, so with there, a question came in regarding the, the news that's been reported many places, Wall Street Journal and others, about the, the Trump administration's decision to limit the number of humanitarian refugees to be received into the U.S. Oh, that's, that began his first day in office. Um, it, it's greatly, greatly concerning to me. Uh, the, to me, it, it's uh, a, a, um, a rejection of something that is so fundamentally American in the best sense of who we are. Um, this unwillingness uh, to receive people who flee, uh, have to flee their countries. Uh, you know, this poor Lady Liberty standing in New York Harbor it has been made into a liar. Um, and of course, you know, as So many have recognized the influx of immigrants and refugees into our country has been part of the genius that has made this country what, what it is. Uh, besides the rejection of those who are sent to us from refugee camps through that formal refugee system, and that whole system is basically shut down right now, uh, I believe that the people arriving at our southern border are in the vast majority uh, should be categorized as refugees and not simply immigrants because that also is a case of forced immigration where families have no choice but to flee for their lives. 
uh, to come to our border. They are not economic refugee or immigrants. Um, and we have closed our hearts and our doors to them as well. Um, a, a tragic violation of our nation's best impulses and of the gospel. Thank you. Next question regards uh, some of what's been reported about practices at the detention facilities along the border, especially separating the families and abuses of the people held there. Are you aware of anything the church is doing to try to address those situations? Well, certainly uh, the church has been very involved uh, in our U.S. Conference of Bishops has uh, an arm that uh, interacts with uh, the federal government and with the legislature and so on. And we've been extremely active in uh, expressing our concerns at, at that level, which is the level it, it frankly needs to be addressed. Um, we, I've testified in Congress three times uh, and I've visited many other times myself uh, collaborating with that um, national office, uh, as have many other bishops. I suspect Bishop McElroy has had his turns too. Um, and, um, you know, so we're certainly trying to speak out. Uh, I, I stay in contact with the border enforcement agencies here and uh, continue to uh, bring before them the concerns that, that I hear. Uh, the truth right now is that the border is, for all intents and purposes, really literally closed. I mean, there's only a trickle getting through at all. Um, and so much of my attention right now, it's because, because the pandemic gave them the last tool they needed, the administration needed. They declared it a health, part of a health crisis and it and applied what they call Title 42, which allows them to turn back pretty much everyone. Uh, um, although uh, even those they're not supposed to be returning, they're returning, right? So that's in court. But um, uh, my attention turned to the people who are truly um, stuck uh, with no place to go in Ciudad Juarez. Uh, they came that far when they fled their home country. They cannot go back because their life is under threat. They can't go forward. They're stuck in a city that's considered one of the most dangerous in the world right now because of drug cartels. And um, there is no one, uh, practically no one to care for them. Uh, so uh, I created a, a fund here, the, our Border Refugee Assistance Fund, and um, we're trying to do what we can. It, it, uh, admittedly, it's a drop in the bucket, but um, we all have to do what we can do. And I'm sure you all in San Diego are facing the similar issues with Tijuana. Thank you, Bishop. You know, a question came in regarding how polarized and divided we are as a country. Wondering what happened in El Paso after the massacre? Did the community come together? How, how did people respond to that? Thanks for that question. Uh, you know, I, I'm really so proud of my community. And, and I think that um, we have an opportunity here in, in El Paso to in some ways model for the rest of the country what is possible. Rather than reacting in anger and hatred, rather than uh, closing ourselves within our doors and gates in fear. Uh, the people of El Paso, the, I'd say the primary tendency has been to reach out in community and um, the uh, memorial that spontaneously rose up behind the Walmart where the shooting took place was incredible. Just very moving experience. There were hundreds, thousands of people there every night for weeks after that event, just, you know, making themselves part of, of, that, of, of that experience. Um, we, we've tr tried to make sure that uh, we not only memorialize the victims 
uh, with ceremonies and prayers, but um, at the first anniversary, we, we announced that uh, we're going to create a commission on racism in our community and bring together different aspects of culture, uh, not simply like-minded people, but people across the spectrum of um, political leadership, of um, nonprofit leadership, of business, and uh, ev every part of our community to, uh, to see if we can't dig into the uh, reality of um, structural racism in our community, acknowledge it, and, and take some steps as a broad community to, to deal with it. And I, I've had great success in these early days of um, um, bringing together people who are willing to be part of this. Um, so we hope to move forward. Thank you. There are two questions that have to do with uh, Catholic education, especially in the elementary or secondary level, where, where teachers or parents who would like to see more uh, attention to racism are sometimes uh, told to tread lightly or to not talk about it for fear of offending others. And of course, here in California, it's a, it's a tricky issue because our fourth graders, there's a tradition they learn about the missions in California. Mm. Uh, but they're not always given the full context of the mission system. So what would you say to, to those who are teaching or working or, or have children at our schools about how, how they should be taught about the reality of racism? Well, I, I think the first step is certainly for each of us, of us personally to confront these realities and, and to study and learn and read and be open to hard truths. Uh, that um, that will come to light if we do that. Um, we have to confront this reality personally before we can do it for others. Um, and and then we have to have the find the courage to um, to share uh, share that story uh, and to do it in a way that's appropriate, uh, age level appropriate, and so on. Um, but to, you know, the, the education is about the search for truth. And if we're not sharing, discovering it and sharing it, then we're, we're not doing anything for our children. Thank you. Do you have any uh, ideas for practical actions that the parishioners or attendees of a Catholic institution can take in order to confront? the reality of racism? Well, I'd come back to that previous answer. Uh, first of all, we have to ourselves seek conversion. Uh, you know, um, I would say, you know, don't try to do this on your own. <laughs> you know, as Pope Francis says several times in his new encyclical, uh, no person is saved by themselves. Um, in other words, you know, seek to um, come together with others and especially, you know, listen to the stories of those uh, who have been uh, suffering under these systems, under the presence of racism, African Americans and all people of, of color and minorities. Listen to their stories for God's sake. You know, don't presume that you know them. Um, and what I've found is that if I'm willing to, to just give a forum uh, for people and to let people know that I really want to hear, I really want to listen, I really want to understand and to, to walk with them, then they're very willing to, in, to privilege me with with their story that very often they've um, perhaps understood they nobody really wanted to hear. So, so start there, um, listen, and then give a voice to, to people who have experienced these things, who still live under the effects of uh, systemic racism, uh, you know, so that, um, that they can be heard 
more broadly. Um, you know, uh, it, it's 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 a challenging process and sometimes not a comfortable one. Uh, and the last thing I'd like to say about that is, don't try to do it without the light of faith. You know, uh, I I firmly believe that we are not going to find our way through difficulties like this without the help of God, without grace, without that fundamental understanding that God gives us about our identity as members of the family of God. Um, and, and also, as people come to grips with their own personal pain, uh, God will also show a way to address that pain, and not in cheap ways, but in real ways to find the healing that's necessary uh, so that they can be freed from, from really the constraints that that uh, past suffering has caused. Thank you, Bishop. What you were just speaking of there really connects to one thought I wanted to make sure, one question I, I got to put before you, which is, where do, how do you hold on to the hope that you spoke about? Of course, it has to do with faith. Uh, but if, if maybe you could elaborate a little bit more in this time when we could all use more hope. Love to, love to. <laughs> That's right up my alley there. Uh, but, um, you know, obviously, I, I think this, this time of pandemic has, you know, besides the struggles with um, in our country with racism and the like have, you know, challenged our, the hope of, of all of us. But um, as Pope Francis has pointed out so beautifully, uh, you know, it, it's all the more reason that we have to open our hearts to, to God because uh, only an, uh, a delusional understanding of our own human power could lead us to think we can solve this by ourselves. <laughs> you know, I frankly I think that's just a delusion. Um, but, um, but faith tells us, you know, we have a God who has loved us so that it was just for moments such as these, just for experiences such as these, just in the midst when we're having to confront the reality of sin in our own personal lives and in that of our society. And for those moments, Jesus came among us. And for that reason, he took up a cross. And um, for that reason, uh, he showed us that hope never dies uh, for, for a disciple of his uh, because he can transform it and and raise it up that's beautiful thank you you know i also want to mention that a lot of the questions that have come into the chat have expressed great appreciation and admiration for your talk so thank you on behalf of the entire community i just one last question perhaps which uh, uh and then if you want to share any other final thoughts, but the question would be, you know, what would you suggest that a university like ours, a university you're familiar with, um, what can we do to continue to confront the reality of racism and to become more and more of an anti-racist institution? I think this uh, series is a wonderful step in that direction. And uh, obviously you uh, have made this a, a focus and an interest in, in, in your community. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think all of us are being challenged to start within ourselves, but then to look within our communities, right, to the people we're close to and, and to really explore the, the ways that this kind of, um, uh, uh, of collaboration, if you will, with uh, the caste system that we have created in this country uh, can can be be hiding you know can be present among us uh, I think um, building that that um, using that word that Pope Francis uses so often solidarity right uh, among us and 
and seeking to overcome the radical kind of individualism that sets individuals or small groups against the rest um, you know uh, we have to we have to really fight that and um, it's deeply deeply rooted in in our um, in our world right now and particularly in our country so uh, whatever you can do uh, and even in the midst of a pandemic <laughs> to continue to bring people together to encourage them to hear one another to pray with one another to love one another you are doing a great work to overcome the the realities of, of racism in our in our society thank you bishop before I turn it over to J Dr. Burns again for concluding remarks, do you have anything else you'd like to say before we uh, formally thank you again? Well, um, I'd feel a little bit dishonest if I, if I didn't um, uh, ask you before I conclude for, um, for your prayers. Uh, as a couple of you know, uh, just yesterday I, I got the, uh, diagnosis of uh, COVID. And um, thanks be to God, I'm, I'm feeling fine, feeling pretty normal. Um, and I was very happy to be able to give this talk. I tried not to breathe into the microphone, so don't anybody worry. Um, but um, I would very much appreciate your prayers as I continue through the course of this. You can be assured that we'll be praying for you and all those impacted by COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Bishop. We will keep you in our prayers and thank you for your very powerful message, which challenges us all. Uh, and so we thank you for your presence and we promise to have you out in San Diego soon. So- Ah, oh, I'd love it. Okay. Uh, this event was brought to you by the uh, University Ministry and the Harp Center for Catholic Thought and Culture. And the series continues next Thursday at 1230 when we have Dr. Noelle Tia Pratt, who will speak on what she's titled, The Call is Coming from Inside the House. How can the Catholic Church become anti-racist? So we'll see you then. And once again, thank you very much, Bishop. Thanks to President Harris and to Bishop McElroy for being with us. And thanks to all of you. Thank you very much. God bless you all. That was great, thank you. A pleasure, pleasure. I hope it was helpful. Yeah, it was great. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, time for meditation on that, so thank you. Well, hopefully we'll be in touch. In